looking forward to this uh, project that Christian Parker Robinson In 1956, Ebony Magazine ranked Gary, Indiana the number one place for blacks to live at the time. Around the peak of the city's history, Gary was once home to nearly 200,000 citizens. In the late 50s, urban living became obsolete, causing Gary's population to split. Those who could afford to do so moved South County, which led Gary to becoming one of the most segregated cities in America. Growing up in Gary was, um was a dream, in fact. Um, it was a city full of resources. It was a city full of activities. Uh, the city was thriving. There was a thriving downtown. Of course, there was a point during um, my teenage years when it became clear that something was changing. Uh, there was a time when my mother and I would come downtown and start in the 800 block and go all the way down to the 500 block and the street of Broadway uh, was full of stores. Probably by the time I was 13 or 14, there was only mo one movie theater downtown. Uh, the stores were starting to leave. You could see uh, a marked difference and that was in, se in the early 70s really. Yeah, uh, when I was a child, Gary was in its heyday. It was a bustling, uh, robust community. Uh, it was the hub of shopping for Northwest Indiana. Uh, people even came from the east to shop in, in Gary. Uh, we were thriving. There were very few vacant homes. Uh, people were looking for places to live. Uh, we were proud of Gary, Indiana. Uh, it, was, uh, it was our home. Growing up was very exciting because I grew up in a business family. My dad uh, was the first African American to open a gas station in uh, Gary, Indiana uh, in 1923 or 1925. Yeah, I, I, was, I had a kind of a sweet upbringing in terms of activities. Uh, I was a Girl Scout 
from third grade until um, I graduated uh, what they call like middle school. I was also in Jack and Jill, which was where, you know, one of my best friends today, that, that's where we first became friends. I was involved in my church a lot, Israel CME and the children's choir, and also within the youth usher board and ministry. And then I also was involved heavily in politics and public service. I grew up in that tradition. And so from registering former convicted felons to driving people to the poll to being dropped off as a canvasser, uh, both with Obama's campaign in 2008 and with my own mom's and our family friends uh, and getting kind of dropped off on the block and people saying, OK, now you knock on doors. You know, I, I had that upbringing. And I was able to be involved in that stuff growing up in Gary. If your family resided between 11th Avenue and 25th Avenue, uh, there were quite a number of black men and women who had, uh, had businesses. They had um, gas stations. They had the drug stores. They had cleaners. They had auto repair shops. Uh, all the professionals, the attorneys, mm, the, the EMDs, the dentists. Uh, in fact, my dentist growing up was Dr. Marshall, who incidentally uh, was the father of Bill Marshall, the actor. And while Bill was going to school, he worked for his dad uh, as an assistant to uh, assisting him in denti dentistry. At one time, Gary, Indiana had the best school system. You had educators or newly graduates coming from everywhere to teach here in Gary. And so that was a part of the Black Mecca. You came either here to teach or you came here to work at the mill. Now, both of those opportunities, as you would say, are no more. Uh, we, we can't get anybody who went to school here at the Indiana University campus to even stay here and teach because it's, it's just not there anymore. And that saddens me. Well, I'm not going to limit it just to the Black Mecca. I think it's a city that has opportunities for everyone, uh, regardless of race, religion, political background or national origin. It's a place for everybody. So I don't really agree with the term Black Mecca because it's for everyone, regardless of our race. What about City of the Century? Well, City of the Century I would support, and I do agree, agree with that because it was a city that transformed America uh, with United States Steel Corporation. And in later years, we had uh, the entertainment industry was strongly affected by the presence of Michael Jackson. So uh, anywhere you go in the world, uh, one of the questions I do hear uh, is that the home of Michael Jackson. So we want to expand it, not only to Michael Jackson, because we have so many great other people who have done great things that have an effect all over the world. Well, what we were trying to reject uh, with that model uh, was that uh, we were the role model exemplar for the nation, what, what a city could be. Uh, we, were, we were indeed growing, we were vibrant. Uh, we had a robust economy. Uh, people were uh, migrating here. And so that was the concept behind the, the city of the century. If, if you look at pictures of Gary from like the 70s and stuff, um, you know, there was four lanes of traffic going up and down Broadway, you know, and the sidewalks were packed, you know. Um, you know, we had a booming still, you know, going, this was long before I got here, you know. But um, so, so, so then it would be uh, the city of the century, I believe.
The Honorable Katie Hall was first elected to the Indiana House of Representatives in 1974. Uh, Two years later, she ran for the Indiana State Senate and she was a successful candidate. Uh, she was the first African-American woman elected to the um, Indiana General Assembly from Northwest Indiana. Uh, Congresswoman Hall, as she was later known, was a fantastic uh, legislator. She authored legislation for the Gary Genesis Convention Center, the Gary Airport, uh, the Deputy Mayor's Law. She authored over uh, more than 300 bills for education uh, in the state of Indiana. She really enjoyed her time uh, in Indianapolis. And um, most people know her, as we will discuss later for the King National Holiday, but she did many pieces of legislation for Northwest Indiana, and not only that, for the citizens of the state of Indiana. Gary has a lot of famous firsts. Um, and as your mom is one, how did it feel when your mom won mayor for your election? It went, it felt inspiring. That was an unreal feeling, and it made me feel like I should do something. If it wasn't running for mayor, I should do something that will help inspire my community and she did that she mobilized people obviously for her to have been in that position in the first place but even after that and so for me it felt like a magical moment um, and it kind of challenged me to recognize not only um, that I should be helpful and that I should figure out a way to make an impact but how I could do that I think that she and her leadership um, is an example of figuring out what your talents are and figuring out how you can contribute them. So it for sure made me more strategic and thoughtful about how I was growing uh, my skills, obviously how I would pursue my education. I'm in law school now because I'm interested in helping people build businesses and protect their assets and opportunities in cities like Gary. I was um, influenced by Mayor Hatcher um, early in his um, time as mayor, actually before he became mayor. I met him when he was campaigning and um, I was seven. And it just struck me as really cool that someone wanted to serve the city and help the citizens of the community. And, and I immediately remember thinking, well, you know, that sounds like something that would be pretty good to do. I think I want to do that too. And it never occurred to me that he was a man and he was an adult and I was a kid. I was just um, thinking that that was something, one, that needed to be done and that uh, I certainly wanted to do. And so during the course of his time in office, and he served 10, 20 years, he often uh, made himself available. And not just to me, to all you. He was always Proximate. He was always generous with his time. And uh, during each encounter, and it wasn't long, it may have been a brief conversation, it may have just been a wave, I always felt that he was a, a source of motivation and encouragement. And so um, as I got older, I was always thinking about how I might serve the city and how I might serve the city as mayor. Richard Gordon Hatcher, born on July 10, 1933, became the 16th mayor of Gary, Indiana, and the first black man to become elected mayor of a major U.S. city. Hatcher was born in Michigan City, Indiana. He attended Valparaiso and Indiana University. Hatcher launched a primary challenge against an incumbent mayor, Martin Katz, in the Democratic primary, and he won by just 2,300 votes. But when I was in high school, I actually uh, was born in 67. So that was right at the peak of when Mayor Hatcher became mayor of the city of Gary. Um, I think it was like maybe 175,000 people. And we were really, even though I could be like maybe two years old, but we were really from that time until I would say my high school years, really feeling the whole black power kind of thing moving over our city. Everybody was so proud. Everyone was so just 
um, you know, in love with being from Gary, Indiana, because we had so many things going on. Uh, Mayor Hatcher, I consider him um, an icon and somebody that I look up to personally uh, as someone who's very interested in politics and as a civic tech entrepreneur, he was on the new frontier of politics as it was becoming something that black people saw themselves dominating. And obviously my mom, I think, is in that line of folks who were just pioneers for what it meant to be black and to be autonomous and to be able to be in a position to really do things and inspire and uplift your own people. Certainly she was a shining example and is for young black women, but just folks who are on the progressive side of politics in general. Other firsts that have um, really inspired me within the city are Glenn Robinson. I'm a huge basketball fan, but just to see him hold his own nationally, it was incredibly inspirational. And Ron Sullivan, who's a mentor of mine, um, and he's the first in the sense of some of his academic capacities, but he's also, I think, one of the more talented academics that has ever come from this city. And he's just fervent in every way um, as he sort of expands his scholarship to figure out how we can get so many black men who are currently incarcerated out of the system. Him during that period. Shortly uh, and early in uh, 68 now, he's sworn in and, uh, and uh, by the way, there's always been this major debate as to who was the first African-American mayor, he or Carl Stokes of Cleveland, who also won. But I think Hatcher's claim was that he was sworn in first uh, in s late 67 or the early part of 68. So now it's April of his first year, um, and I'm about to, with my wife go back to Philadelphia to apply for teaching jobs in Philadelphia. When I get a call from his office uh, asking me to come down to uh, his office on my lunch hour, I'm thinking it's just to say, don't let that teacher's organization fizzle, try to keep it together and functioning. I get to City Hall and he offers me a job with his administration. Well, two things are wrong with that. I'm, I don't know anything about municipal government. And secondly, I've got one foot out the door getting ready to go to Philadelphia on the spring break later in April to apply for a job in Philadelphia. And I offered a million excuses. I said, well, I'm under contract. And someone picked up the phone and called a school board member and asked whether a teacher can get a, le uh, a leave of absence. And in short, swift, they said, yeah, we can do that. Uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about municipal government. I said, then as I mentioned, that Gary was an urban laboratory. There were all kinds of consultants in and out and technical grants and so forth. They said, we'll get you some assistance. I'd run out of excuses. So I said, well, let me talk it over with my wife. And she accepted the challenge as well. If that's what you want to do, we can try that. And I started with him in, um, after the spring break in, in April and was with him all uh, through 1988, his four terms in office. And there was always some challenge. You know? I mean, uh, at that point, uh, it, it, municipal government for an African-American and all of us rookies was, was kind of challenging. Uh, but we trudged on through challenge after challenge, and he made it for four um, terms as mayor of the city of Gary. I met him at Valparaiso University in the stairwell, and I was in the School of Liberal Arts studying uh, government and political science, and he was in the law school, which was one floor below. And we met in the stairwell, and we be began to talk, and we became friends. And um, we remained friends uh, until um, he ran for mayor and I ran for councilman at large. He believed at the time that my running for councilman at large would hurt his chances 
at becoming uh, mayor of Gary. Actually, he didn't because we both won. And one of his travels across the country, he was always traveling somewhere, he crossed paths with James Brown, who was the uh, African-American entertainer at that time. And James Brown wanted to know what he could do to help him in his, uh, I think this may have been his third or fourth year. And the mayor said, well, you could come in and do a concert and raise some money for youth activities. Uh, <laughs> that turned out to be a debacle because I think part of it was that James Brown was disappointed after all of the arrangements were made that the mayor was not there personally to greet him at the airport. And Gary had never had uh, uh, activity that, that size at Westside. Westside's gymnasium could seat 6,000 folk. And Gary at that point wasn't accustomed to buying tickets in advance. So it was a cold winter night and the line was wrapped double around the gymnasium. People wanted tickets in, this was the early, late 60s. I think the tickets were only five or six bucks. Uh, but people wait till the last minute, don't, didn't buy tickets in advance. And they, uh, we were trying to collect that, all that money and get folk into the gymnasium out of that cold. And as the gymnasium filled up, then James Brown's manager walks out and says, well, we have to settle up on uh, Mr. Brown's um, cost. And so I said, what do you mean? Now, I'm in charge of this now. And the, and the mayor is on his way back, I think, from Philadelphia. I said, what do you mean? This is supposed to be a benefit concert. He says, well, Mr. Brown has expenses. And if it were a benef true benefit, we would not have brought the full band and all the dancers and so forth. I said, my goodness. By the time we finished counting up the money, which was at that point, it's hard to count up to $15,000 with all those singles and $5 bills, which delayed the concert even more. People in the gymnasium are restless, angry, all this two hours now after the starting time. Um, we counted the money, $15,000 roughly. Uh, James Brown's manager took it, and put it in two or three briefcases and said, Mr. Brown are now come on stage. Long story short, I said, man, now the mayor is back now wanting to know, well, what's going on? I said, well, it wasn't exactly a benefit. Mr. Brown wanted to be compensated for all of this. And now I don't know how in the world we explain the next day that we had the largest concert in the history of Gary and don't have a cent in the bank to show for that. And it was difficult explaining all that, and it became, it, got, it made national news once more, soul brother number one, arguing with a first African-American mayor. And so James Brown's people then wanted to kind of soothe that over and wanted them to get together on national TV to say it wasn't that big a deal or whatever, we can resolve this. Interestingly enough, a couple of months after that, the mayor calls me at home and says, uh, Charlie, did we file all those papers for the, Hat the Youth Foundation? I said, no, man, they're on your desk somewhere. And he says, well, we need to go ahead and get that done. I just got a call from Bill Cosby, and Bill Cosby wanted to know more about what happened between me and James Brown. And I explained to him, and he wanted to know how much money did we lose on that. And I told him the, about $15,000. He says, well, don't tell anybody, but I'll send you a check for that amount that we did not get as a result of the confusion between Hatcher and James Brown. And that story was never told publicly about the fact that Bill Cosby, that was, I mean, that was like you're writing a check for $5. Uh, he, he wrote a check and sent it here for the $15,000, which saved our buns uh, as a result of having to explain we didn't have any money in the, in the Youth Foundation account as a result of having 6,000 people jammed into a gymnasium. the National Black Political Convention, they were trying to, at that time, 
what I believe is established their own party. Like they didn't want to be a part of the Democrats, Republicans. They wanted to have their own black national party. And they came here to Gary in 1972. And I think next year we'll celebrate, or maybe 22, 2022, we'll celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of it. Um, so I know some people are working on trying to, you know, do at least some kind of recognition or reincarnation of it if they could. But um, it was a good time for Gary. You talk about the Black Mecca. It was all of those people that, you know, I would have anybody watch the, um, there is a, I think a video of the convention. They showed um, this past summer at the Railcats baseball stadium to commemorate it. So I'll get that information for you and pass it on. That was certainly uh, uh, a tremendous moment in Gary's history where we hosted the National Black uh, Convention. Uh, I was a first year city council member at that time. And uh, Mayor Hatcher put me over the, the youth. And so I coordinated all the housing arrangements and the entertainment for the young people who came to that convention. Uh, we used uh, elementary schools for, for dormitories for uh, the young people who came uh, outside of this area to be a part of that experience. I got a chance to see uh, all the icons of the civil rights movement at that convention. Uh, I remember the confrontations that we had at the beginning, the, the, the crisis that, uh, where you had double delegations coming to represent certain states and uh, that the convention started maybe about three or four hours late because they had to resolve that, that issue. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was a great two day experience. What makes Gary so special or significant to you? Well, uh, being a pastor, um, I, I guess I would have to lean more on the church scene of Gary. Um, now, I had some great mentors, Dr. Vern G. Smith, the White Pointer, um, uh, Mr. William Reese, the principal at uh, Roosevelt, great mentors. But what really truly shaped me was the church scene of Gary. Um, the church scene was very, uh, at the time, very vibrant. Uh, very active and engaging. And as I grew older, um, I didn't even understand how important it was until I started pastoring because traveling across the country and how so many other cities and churches would um, talk about the Gary, Indiana simultaneous revival, you know, uh, how so many people wanted to come to little old Gary to preach. And so um, it was, the church scene was, you know, it was impactful. The people of the city were the churches, the church memberships. Uh, back then, particularly the revival culture, um, I mean, you could have uh, for the breakfast service um, the first week after um, Easter, you would have three, four hundred people coming to church at seven o'clock to hear preaching. Uh, Noonday, three, four hundred people uh, coming to hear preaching, and then the evening that uh, you have forty to fifty churches all in revival at the same time, and those churches would be packed with people because they were. You know, they want to hear preaching. And so um, uh, it, it's really what uh, put one of the things that put Gary on the map uh, was the revival culture. Now, unfortunately, now because the city is being uh, is on a decline and people are moving away and uh, the youth are not as actively engaged in church, the revival scene is not what it used to be. But um, uh, anyone across the country uh, that's a known preacher uh, of fame, uh, Freddie Haynes, Ralph West, those type of preachers would tell you that a lot of them got their start in Gary, Indiana at the simultaneous revival. Now, before, uh, if you was a pastor in Alabama, the South, you wanted to come to Gary to preach. That was, you know, um, it, it amazes me why I, I would hear the stories at the conventions. Everybody wanted to get to Gary to preach. Gary is, was one of the places where 
uh, relationships were formed and preaching was just powerful. We had, I mean, we, Gary had some great preachers, Julius James, uh, F. Brandon Jackson, Charles Emery, who's still living, who's, who, who is a, um, a national preacher. I mean, we had people, um, that could just do it, you know? Um, and so therefore, um, people always have viewed Gary as a preaching, uh, city, um, now, um, and, and I just be honest, um, I'm more so preaching Baptist city. Um, we have most different types of churches in Gary, but Baptist has been the predominant, uh, denomination in the, which has, um, uh, uh, I say far as, uh, labeled Gary as, as, as being, but, um, but if you ask anyone now, maybe not so now, but people, I don't, they fight to come to Gary, uh, this past week. Uh, yeah, last week we had our uh, simultaneous revival fall seminar, and we had one of the nation's top preachers, Cedric, Cedric Reveal. Um, we had Johnny Miller from Chicago. Uh, everybody in the country knows who Johnny Miller is. So uh, Gary is still, I, I would say, valued as that. Uh, but as in any city now, uh, out um, for smaller city, uh, even some of the largest ones, there has been a great fall in the weather churches, particularly tr traditional churches. Now, a lot of the charismatic churches, mega churches, you want to call them that, um, they draw, but it's a different feel, different flavor in, in which I believe the city of Gary preaching was established on. There were, there was an effort on the part of of white activists and p political figures to have Gary's uh, southern boundary extended to to United to U.S. 30, uh, which is Maryville today. Uh, Hatcher opposed that. He he did not want the. Um, boundary to go beyond 53rd Avenue and and he believed that it would handicap him from being reelected as mayor of Gary and so the um, there was legislation uh, introduced by I believe it was Adam Benjamin who was state center state senator at the time that eliminated the buffer zone uh, which existed between Gary and Maryville the unincorporated unincorporated area of, of the area the Indiana law said that there had to be a buffer zone between municipalities one of my colleagues somehow this was before I got to the General Assembly it erased that uh, piece of the legislation that said that there has to be a two mile or four mile buffer zone and that meant that Gary and Mar Maryville was created, Maryville created and right there's nothing that separates them instead of, except a, a street sign uh, and once more mainly because uh, that was all farmland out there in Maryville before it, it, it just grew and grew and, and um, and now we as African Americans are probably the major uh, uh, residents in Maryville now. Uh, and they're moving farther south to Crown Point and on to St. John and anything to get away from us uh, African Americans. But the lakefront is not going anywhere and U.S. Steel is not going anywhere. So they all, I mean, early, it's five or six o'clock in the morning, if you stand out there somewhere near I-65, it looked like it's daylight out there because all those cars traveling into the city of Gary because the majority of the employees are from are, are, uh, white and live outside of the corporate limits of Gary. Well, you know, um, Gary's economics was robbed by uh, by the creation of Maryville. I represent Maryville now, 
and I try to do my best to support them. And I recognize they're part of my district and I would never be a traitor to them, but the truth is the truth. Uh, you know, there's a cycle that uh, oppressors put oppressed people through. When we came to this country, we were in uh, shackles and chains. And so we were in physical bondage. We had to stay on the, plat uh, on the plantation. We had to go where the master said we had to go. We had to do what the master said do. So we were in physical bondage. Uh, when we were freed from the plantation, uh, then we were put into what was called political bondage. We were considered three-fifths of a person. Uh, therefore, we didn't have the right to vote. So when we broke out of political bondage, cities like Gary, uh, when they broke out of political bondage, what the oppressor did was put us in the next phase of bondage, which is economic bondage. They took away the lifeblood of our community. What is the lifeblood of our community? It's, it's the tax base that we had. It's the businesses that we, that we had. And so we got a Chet Dobas who uh, took our buffer zone, which was our growth area, and created a city, a town in, in, that, in that, that area. So they put us in economic bondage. What automatically comes with economic bondage is a social bondage. If you don't have resources, people begin to exhibit antisocial behavior. And so what we had was the, the naming of Gary being the murder capital of the Midwest, and we had drug sales and people doing all kinds of things to survive. And so we were in social bondage. And, and once you're in social bondage, what happens is with your antisocial behavior, you end up going to prison. Prison is a new plantation. And so we're back in physical bondage. So when you get into physical bondage back in, the, in, in prisons, then you come out and you don't have the right to vote. Initially, you come out, you, you, all, all of your rights to vote is gone, so you're back in political bondage. And because we don't have the knowledge to understand that in this state and many states across the United States, once you become a felon, you can never vote again. But in Indiana, you can. I've tried to convince, convince inmates, uh, uh, ex-inmates, that uh, ex-felons, that, that they can vote. And they said, no, I can't, I can't vote. I'm not gonna get in trouble. I'm not gonna register to vote. And so we're, we're back in political bondage. So, we're, so they're back in political bondage and they go back into economic bondage. We also got a record. It's difficult for you to get a job, so you're in economic bondage, and then you go from economic bondage, you gotta survive, you go back into a social bondage, you start doing antisocial things, and you end up back in prison. We call it recidivism. It's a process, and that's what oppressors are doing to us. And, you know, we, we have the, the, uh, a, 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 a city here that is a prime opportunity for anybody who wants to come in and invest. But what's gonna happen is that they're gonna let Gary go down as far as it can go down. They're gonna come in and buy it over, up and take it over. That's what they did in Annapolis. Look at what they did in Annapolis. When I first went to the legislature in 1990, when I went down there, downtown Indianapolis was the pits. I didn't wanna stay down. I could've got a condo. It was really nice for 35,000, but nobody wanted to stay in downtown Indianapolis. But look at it now. And that's what's gonna happen. That's what's gonna to happen to us, and we don't understand that we have a diamond in the rough and that we need to hold on to it. The streets of Gary, Indiana changed during the crack era of 1980 and 1990s. In the 1990s, as the city became crowned for having the highest homicide rate in the country, it was given the name Murder Capital. The only thing I knew about Gary was that it was uh, the murder capital of the United States, I think. Gary was known as the murder capital in 1994 and 2005 because the crack cocaine epidemic hit Gary hard. When you are living in poverty, when you see your city decline before your eyes, that leads to a lot of hopelessness, particularly if you can't get a job, if you can't support your family if you don't have the means to do what people expect to be able to do. And so as a consequence, people turn to um, alcohol and other drugs, and those other drugs uh, included crack cocaine. And because of the highly addictive nature of crack, and because of the um, drug dealing and other criminal enterprises associated with crack, uh, Gary, 
had an increasing murder rate and because of the statistical analysis made us one of the highest per capita uh, murder rates in the country. I, I, I can remember though, uh, growing up that time, because everybody, you know, I, um, by the time I was a senior at Roosevelt for my freshman year, I think um, off the top of my head, I had lost about nine friends to gun violence. Um, and so in doing so, um, uh, you know, you had this fear. Matter of fact, one of my best friends was killed immediately after we graduated from high school. Um, you know, will I, you know, will I be shot? Will I be next? Am I gonna get hit by the straight bullet? And, um, and, and honestly, uh, I had the guns put up, put on me in some circumstances. Uh, I was in places where, you know, uh, people had been shot at. And, uh, but I thank God, my relationship with God, that I was never a victim. And so I can remember praying, uh, saying, Lord, please don't let me be shot. Man, I, I mean, we could talk about this for, forever because the same thing happened in every other inner city across the country when our government introduced drugs, cocaine into the, into the inner city. Um, it was devastating. And I think here we had a, we had a, a, a trifecta because you know, people were coming back home. No, that was the seven. So people coming home from the war, but no, we had a, a double whammy. The steel mill started to close, which had employed a lot of people in this area. No other jobs were around, and drugs were introduced. For me, that's a recipe for disaster. And people talk about why, well, if you don't have any money, why do people turn to drugs? I'm like, everybody didn't do drugs. Most people sold drugs, and they sold drugs out of necessity. And government made our made the made getting drugs easier than it was to get a job, and people took advantage of it. And you know that's when Gary, when people started, you know, killing each other over uh, street corners and and you know stealing and robbing and, and everything that comes with you know a place where there are no jobs available. We had four steel mills, and we only have one now, and that's U.S. Steel. That hurt our economy. That hurt our people, because now you had to go outside of the, the city of Gary to find a job, and most people worked in Gary. They thrived in Jer Gary. They shopped in Gary, and now you don't have that. You have all that taken away because of, you know, I don't know what happened with our steel mills. Uh, well, I do know what happened. They were outsourced to China and all those places, and when you have that happen, you know, the consequences were we were running around like we we're in the jungle, like the wild, wild west. And it was it was rough. I mean, I've seen, you know, friends get killed over drugs. Some of my best friends end up selling drugs. Some of my best friends end up going to prison. Um, and these are some of the guys who had two parent households that fell into the trap of making quick money because there weren't any jobs around. When I think about uh, Gary today, um, the most important resource that we don't have is uh, tax dollars. Because of the white flight, because of the decline of our industrial and manufacturing industries, we have uh, probably half or less the tax base that we once had. And as a result of that, it is hard to uh, create a city that people can be proud of. Uh, the city looks run down. Uh, the schools are suffering. So you don't have the education that you once had in the city of Gary. In fact, Gary was once regarded as a world-class educational system. Uh, you don't have that regard anymore. And uh, at the end of the day, the tax dollars have had a devastating impact on government in Gary and as a result on the city of Gary.
Yeah, I was there actually. I was there um, when we were at the Genesis Center, and I, I thought that particular event probably left me with an impression about opportunities in the city. That just was not true, and that meant that, uh, you know, I heard this from someone else, but Donald Trump was really positioning folks in the city to support this grand idea he had to revitalize the city, right? That he was going to bring infinite opportunities. I think that Miss America pageant moment was so unfortunate because it gave folks in the city, myself included as a child, a sense of false hope as to the investment that he would offer. And so that was um, really unfortunate. It obviously can happen again, but it should put everyone on guard for folks who come into the city who may not be from here and have questionable motives. That was looting. That's all it was looting. Here, Donald Trump was bringing money here, and he was playing with his partner who wanted to be great, uh, Scott King. And uh, uh, we gave them $6 million towards, the, the, you know, $3 million each year towards that, uh, that pageant. Big ripoff, big ripoff. What do we get from it? People do, there are cities who, who invest in projects like that. But when they do it, what happens? They get the spin off. They get hotel rooms that are filled. They have restaurants that are, that are supported. There are souvenir shops. There are, there, are, there are clothing centers where people go and spend money when they come. That was not the case for Gary, Indiana. Where did they stay? In Maryville and in Chicago. They didn't stay in gear because we had no hotels. Where did they eat? I don't know where they ate, but I know they didn't eat any restaurants because I know they weren't taking them to McDonald's and Burger King to eat. And so what I'm saying to you, that was a ripoff. I'm glad that we woke up in that third year of that contract, we, we nipped it in the bud. Not in the nipped it in the bud, we nipped it. And, uh, and we didn't go through it. But that was another example of looting. And guess what? We were cooperative in that looting process. I think that um, back in 2005 when Gary was the murder capital, I was probably four or five during those times. I remember um, different things happening when my brother was losing friends. Um, his friends were getting killed and that was another reason why in 2005 my mother moved us to Maryville. But I still attended Gary's schools. My brother attended Maryville High School. So my mom um, always said that she refused to lose her son to the streets of Gary. So when we moved to Maryville and my mom put my brother in Maryville schools, he still was a part of AAU for Gary. Um, he still did a lot of different things like that. So the dynamic of him still hanging with his friends and Gary was there. Um, so for me, finally in 2007, when my brother Anthony was killed in the streets of Gary, it kind of put a damper on our family because the same exact thing that my mother worked so hard to protect her child from um, ended up being the thing that she could never protect him from. I think that a lot of actions of young people um, in the city of Gary is because of the environment that they are living in. They become a product of their environment and you have choices in life. And sometimes even with having a choice, you still become a product of where you come from. And I feel like um, with the young man that killed my brother Anthony, he was 15, my brother Anthony was 16. And the way of forgiving him for me was at 15, he made a decision that changed his entire life. And um, he was released this year, 2020. And I decided to forgive him. I decided to let him know out of my mouth that I didn't hate him. Um, I had no anger in my heart from him that he owed me nothing, but he owed God everything. And the reason behind that is because I understand how you can become a product of the area that you're in, trying to fit in. Um, the night my brother was killed, he went out with his friends, they got into a fight. Um, he got out to break up the fight with his friends and the young man that killed my brother, friends told him to shoot. And so in that situation, I don't think that he meant to kill anyone. I think he wanted to fit in, he wanted to feel loved. So when you think of young people that come from an environment of wolves and you're trying to patch them up and you're trying to give them different things, if they don't know how to be loved, how can they express love? We kind of got this silo thing going on over here. You know, uh, everybody has to have their own and I'm not sure why. There's so many brilliant, brilliant people and hardworking people out here um, and, and can actually create for themselves, you know, an opportunity. Um, but they don't want to, uh, it seems to me at least, that they don't want to uh, 
join with other like-minded folks. Do you feel me? All right. So it's kind of like uh, you know they 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 don't want to work together with other people who might already be doing what they want to do. You know, for whatever reason. And then there's what I call the crab barrel effect. You familiar with that? You familiar with the crab barrel? You know, you get a barrel full of crabs. They all they got to breathe air. They're all going up to get air. Right. Well, the one gets to the top. Well, the one on the bottom says, "Wait a minute, I want that air." He reaches up. He'll grab him by the leg, and <laughs> you know. Um, so I don't. I don't. There's plenty. There's plenty for everybody to eat here in Gary, and for whatever reason, um, I can't really put my finger on it. But it's kind of like that's mine. As I've been thinking about this, you know, in this day of 2020, you know, you think of a band of thieves that you know come in and steal and break windows, do all kind of destruction. And, you know, that's how they're in the name of protest. We have looters now who have been, you know, just that doing all of that, what I just mentioned. But I could see now and initially my thought was, I don't really see how we've been looted. I don't really. But now I understand your point very clearly in thinking of the looting that, you know, not only has been done by big businesses like the meal, you know, they come here and people have come here with a bill of goods saying that, oh, this is what's good for your city. Allow me to do this. Give me a tax break for this. Give me, you know, give me, give me, give me. And you're like, okay, because you're thinking that, you know, any development and people come in and say, oh, we have jobs. We're bringing this value to your community. We'll bring this to your school system. And, and you're right. They, it, it's just been one big loop. I would have to say that there's a number of people that probably took advantage of Gary, Indiana, you know, for what was here uh, and what could have continued to be here. But they chose not, I believe that they chose, I don't have a whole lot of exact information, but I believe that um, some of the resources could have been used in other ways. I think Gary has been looted of some of the more material and tangible things, obviously businesses, thriving schools, libraries, and all sorts of innovative spaces that will help us build our education and vocations. But I think the city has been looted of some basic things we need to thrive, like love. Well, looted to me means that something is uh, being taken away uh, unfairly. Uh, that someone else is taking advantage of the resources that belong to a certain person or a certain group or a city and without just compensation. Uh, loot is when you take. My definition of looted is something important being taken away, something vital being taken away from a community, depriving them of something that is needed, not even a community, but anything in life. Gary has been looted, been looted by big business, 